The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Trader's Edge with Steve Rhodes. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648 or internationally at 727-873-7618. The Trader's Edge. Now, Steve Rhodes. Good morning, Tigers. This is Jacob filling in for Steve as he explores the old world. We're going to fill in for him today. We got a lot of stuff to look at, a lot of cool things happening. First, I want to just jump in quickly and look at Steel Dynamics. And you know I love Steel Dynamics, um, but we were looking at this level uh, about the end of last month, right? We we're hitting that 90 and it was the, we had big volume. And I was saying, you know, take a look at this because as it resisted, we might get a little breach up to 100 and we finally did, right? Um, how the whole steel market is, is moving right now, I still think we might get a, a retest at least of, you know, kind of the last day with volume. But it'll be interesting to see it. And Nucor has been making the same kind of moves. Um, but we finally hit that 100 mark, um, which, you know, it had been trying um, all the month of May. So that's some interesting development. Again, love that stock. Um, let's take a look. The Qs are down. Uh, GDX down a little bit, although it had been, uh, I think it kind of bumped up this morning pretty heavily. Let's see here. Yeah. And then we just kind of had it collapse back down. Um, how the gold's moving as well is super interesting. It's definitely looking for a bottom there and uh, looking to see if it can take off. The dollar down, uh, minorly uh, spy down. And the Russell's really been taken off today. It had a lot of like flow in capital wise. So we'll see kind of how that pans out as well. Big news going on is going to be Apple. And I was talking about it a little bit yesterday, and I'm sure the other hosts have been speaking about it as well. But Apple is finally releasing, um, you know, everyone's calling it virtual reality, right? Their goggles. But this is a little bit better. And this is, I think, where Meta missed the mark quite a bit uh, with their Oculus. Uh, you know, the Oculus and what uh, Facebook or Meta was essentially releasing was total virtual reality, right? So laying over um, or, or rather projecting a, a totally virtual uh, kind of set for the wearer, right? This has been, you know, that, how does that really appeal to the most amount of people? It's not. It seems almost like dystopian, right? Younger folks, um, we like using that kind of stuff. Um, Meta was really trying to compete with something called VR Chat. Um, VR Chat is is very popular um, among the younger generation, uh, and essentially you can be whoever you want um, and just interact with anyone however you like, right? Total anonymity in a totally um, virtual world. Again, I think that's not super appealing for the average consumer, again, sounding dystopian. What Apple's doing is much more, I guess they're calling it um, mixed reality, but in reality, it's, it, it's augmented, yeah? And so you're still seeing um, your environment, except it's overlaying uh, different kind of interfaces for you. In this, I know it's, it's, you know, you can have plenty of jokes regarding uh, entertainment regarding it, but really, I mean, you think about like the applications of something like this in, in education, in healthcare, in manufacturing. I mean, uh, A to B in the, in the den yesterday brought up um, a really good point of these uh, augmented reality glasses from a company called Vuzix. And I was doing some more research on them and surgeons are using Vuzix, these, these, this augmented reality software, in order to uh, just be better at their job, right? Enter in at the correct angle, um, see if there's anything that looks, you know, irregular to the, to the program itself. This is, this is massive, right? The, the biggest in all of existence, the, the, the biggest weak point is kind of the human factor. Um, you know, when you're mixing it with technology, and what this kind of does is, is really eliminate that, right? It's just, it's just a tool, but it makes things so much better. Apple, I think, has the potential to really make this popular uh, on a large scale. So the adoption will be um, for everything, not just, you know, medical as Vuzix is. You know, <clears throat> in some capacity, if the, the way that I was looking at it, it's like, say you've never worked on a car before, in your life, right? Maybe it broke down. Let's say you had these goggles, and this is, I'm sure, you know, a decade out 
when the developers uh, at Apple get everything under uh, their belt regarding uh, different applications for the goggles. But I mean, you could take a look at the internal of this of this car and immediately know what everything is, right? You'll have an interface, a, you know, a heads up display telling you, okay, you know, this is where the oil is, this is the engine, so on. And you essentially just tell it this is the problem and uh, in ways it can, it can walk you through this. And this is just obviously, this is, you know, gonna be for the future, but this is kind of how groundbreaking something like this is. It, it's not just for, you know, being on the internet, watching YouTube videos, watching movies, uh, you know, anyone theoretically could do anything. So currently, you know, the price points at like 3,500, you know, I'll even pop it up right now. The, the, the price points at 3,500, which is steep, but right now it's just in development, right? It's going to developers and what Apple's seeking to do is essentially let them sit on it, you know, for some a period of time and then have them develop whatever application they want for it. And then they'll go through the process. Is this, uh, is this gonna be beneficial? Does this work? Does this make sense for the consumer? And then, you know, in a few years, you can have it be a little bit more affordable. But if you seriously think about it, like this is an invaluable technology once it gets fleshed out. Uh, super interesting. Um, I even think about it in the case of like pharmaceuticals, right? Uh, you know, if you're a nurse or you're learning or something, you can look at uh, a pill bottle. It has the patient's name. Automatically that interfaces with the database that the hospital has. Uh, it tells you when they last took it. Um, what conflicts uh, may arise regarding other pharmaceuticals. It's just massive, guys. And I, um, I think that will become more apparent uh, as, as the years go on, just, just how important something like augmented reality is. Of course, Meta has really cut uh, that aspect. Uh, they were, again, trying to sell something that's already popular to a bunch of people, uh, a bunch of consumers who... Um, you know, haven't adopted it already. And, and again, it was just kind of freaky to some capacity. And you really, you know, you even had Oculus, uh, one of the major coders, um, or developers, excuse me, he, he left. He's like, this doesn't make much sense. That was a few months ago. And so it kind of made sense. Obviously they cut it and uh, people, people love that. And so the stock goes up, but Apple's gonna dominate in this phase. They're just a juggernaut. They have so much cash. I mean, like we were even talking about them going into banking. They just have so much cash in order to really make this um, as important as it really is uh, for, for the trajectory of, of human history, honestly, in my opinion. So that'll be uh, neat to see out. A little bit today, um, you know, we always touch on the kind of CRE crisis that's going to happen. Uh, Hilton San Francisco just decided to say, I'm not going to pay anymore. Um, and so the owner of uh, San Francisco Union Square, Hilton San Francisco Union Square in Park 55 has chosen just to stop making payments on the 725 million in debt. And then they gave the keys over to JP Morgan. That's pretty massive. Um, this is the quote from them. After much consideration and thought, we believe it is best interest for park stockholders uh, to materially reduce our current exposure to the Fran San Francisco market. And even your elites essentially, and, and I mean that in the political sense of San Francisco, they're saying there's some tough roads ahead figuring out how they're gonna basically get out of this. Uh, and that was the mayor of San Francisco who was talking about that. We'll go a little bit more into that uh, when we get back. Folks, stay tuned. You can send me an email if you want. Get in the den, get in the den, get in the den. Folks, we'll be right back. We have exciting news, Tigers. This June, Tim Ord of the Ord Oracle will be hosting two webinars, providing insight into his renowned market timing methodologies. On June 8th, Tim will delve into the S&P 500, teaching sentiment indicators, identifying market bottoms and divergence, and so much more. On June 15th, Tim pivots to the gold market, taking a look at cycle analysis, ratio studies, advanced decline indicators, and other important tools for analyzing this sector. Sign up today on TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30-plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex Report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, 
dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors you might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn. And he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, educating investors. Call, call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, before we went on break, we were talking about basically Hilton uh, just saying we're not going to pay any more on $725 million in debt to J.P. Morgan Chase regarding um, large buildings. So just to quote a little bit more uh, of the group CEO, he says, Now more than ever, we believe San Francisco's path to recovery remains clouded and elongated by major challenges. Uh, a weaker expected citywide convention calendar through 2027, uh, this will negate... Uh, excuse me, negatively impact business and leisure demand. And so, yeah, a lot of this in some ways is uh, reflecting kind of the issues that exist in San Francisco itself. Um, but there is a larger scale issue regarding this. That's, that's going to affect everyone. What I'm pulling on here is this article, and this is half of big multinationals plan to cut office space in the next three years. Now, of course, we're talking about hotels, but let's look at, you know, large real estate in general, right? Survey shows how companies are adapting uh, their property portfolios to change working patterns. And, you, you know, th there was this conversation. I, I know Jamie Dimon was talking about it and Elon Musk, uh, you know, this really big emphasis on working on the office. And that's super important for sure. With everything that's happened, even prior to COVID, right, like in 2019, you had, and I would say, you know, even earlier than that, but, but it really took off in 2019, this idea of like digital nomadicism, right? Uh, when I had traveled overseas in 2019, uh, everyone that I was staying with in the hostel was a quote-unquote digital nomad, right? And it, it's almost just become kind of ingrained into the, the daily work. And there's an effort to essentially corporatize this, okay? So, you know, don't go in some area that's, you know, 12 hours exactly um, opposite. Uh, you need to work at these times no matter where you are. So corporations are building in this idea of nomadicism, uh, even with people who aren't just contractors. Uh, so it, it's it's assumed that this kind of office space, uh, excuse me, the demand for it 
uh, will certainly continue to decrease. So about half of large multinationals are planning to cut office space in the next three years as they adapt to the rise of home working since the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, the Knight Frank survey of executives in charge of real estate at 350 companies around the world uh, that together employ 10 million people found that among major groups cutting their footprint, uh, the largest number was aiming to reduce space by 10 to 20 percent. That is pretty significant. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see how we ad adapt away from that. W one of the tigers I, I speak to every morning, uh, he lives in a big city on the East Coast. Um, you know, their buildings there are, are beautiful, so you're not going to really, even though they're not being occupied, you don't really want to get rid of them. And it'll be interesting to see kind of how the free market adapts to that, whether that at some point will be used for housing, um, storage, whatever it may be. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that adapts. And I, I would say keep your eye out for any opportunity in the next few years regarding addressing these kind of issues. But, you know, even to give you, and we can run back a little bit, you know, with, with Hilton, obviously that's, that's hotel, but let's look at the large spaces, even, even in um, uh, residential, right? Uh, I have a family member who essentially works uh, with, you know, essentially acts as like an investment bank um, to help people invest in low income housing. Uh, this helps them uh, pay less taxes, right? So, we look a lot at, let's say, um, this particular uh, example will be uh, insurance companies, okay? They had one where they had purchased this low-income housing building, this somewhere in Chicago, and they had paid something, I think, like $78 million for this, this whole kind of portfolio, right? And then five years later, and this was in like 2020, 2021, um, it insurance company came and paid something like 300 for it, right? And this is really showing you how quickly these kind of investments just skyrocketed. Um, and on the long term, obviously, insurance companies kind of get knocked out pretty consistently for doing stuff like that. Um, but if you, you know, you apply that to everything, these large kind of uh, investment buildings, whether it's commercial real estate, whether it is residential, whether it's something leisurely, um, there's going to be some, some problems regarding it, especially as the economy is in this kind of strange little spot. Um, so it says here nearly half the companies surveyed are also planning to change their headquarters in the next three years. We've seen a lot of, uh, seen a lot of that, essentially, um, especially with footwear. Um, however, a uh, majority of smaller companies are planning to expand their office space, which is kind of an interesting um, little balance to that. On the same kind of topic, more so just honestly in residential housing, this is kind of just a neat little story. Um, and I would say it definitely does. There's a little bit, <laughs> like kind of diverting from the point on this, deviating from the point. Anyways, I found this interesting. The Supreme Court overrules local governments for seizing homes. And there was a story that came out um, uh, of this lady. Uh, she was, I think, in her 80s, and she had owed, I don't know, something like 1000 or $2,000 to the government, and it was for a very long period of time. And this was in California. And the government decided to seize her house. Uh, you know, that's not even close to the same amount of value. Um, the Supreme Court, or at least some law firm, had done some investigation and found that this is actually pretty, like, you know, widespread, and the Supreme Court finally ruled on it. Uh, and this is that local governments um, who seized two homes over unpaid tax debts and kept sale proceeds, so they were, they were taking the asset and then selling it and then keeping the essentially the profit um, out of, you know, the, the cost to, to pay back the person's debt. Uh, they, they ruled that this was unconstitutional, and, and no doubt. Uh, and this case came after the Pacific Legal Foundation, which represented the homeowners in both cases, uh, released a report late last year saying that 12 states and the District of Columbia allow local governments and private investors to seize dramatically more than what is owed from homeowners uh, who fall behind on property tax payments. Uh, PLF is a national nonprofit, so <laughs> it's insane that they can do it here. We can look at it. This is the lady I was talking about, Geraldine Tyler, um, owed, uh, owned a modest one bedroom. Uh, the rent on her new apartment stretched her resources and she fell into arrears on her condo's property tax bills. And this was 2,300 in tax owed, um, along with uh, you know, 12,700 in penalties, interest and costs, wild. The condo was valued at 93,000 and the county that seized it sold it for 40,000 and kept 15,000 over and just put it in their coffers. Pretty insane. And uh, this appears to be a little bit more widespread um, than any American, I feel like, would like to think, right? We could all, at some point, you know, knock on wood, we don't, but end up in a situation like that. So they're calling it home equity theft. Very, very interesting. Supreme Court did its job on that one.
uh, very interesting. But we'll see how, you know, what's done after that in order to actually, like, you know, make amends um, and pay back debt. Another big news, um, the SEC obviously is suing Coinbase, uh, saying that they were unregistered, essentially. SEC sued Coinbase on Tuesday, alleging the company was operating as an unregistered exchange uh, and broker, and that 13 assets listed on the platform were considered crypto asset securities. Uh, the regular asset exchange be permanently restrained and enjoined from doing so, and the suit comes just one day uh, after the SEC sued Binance and its former, uh, excuse me, founder, CZ. Folks, stay tuned, we'll be right back. Kathy Woods, believe it or not, just bought a bunch of Coinbase. report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at tfnn.com. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tigers Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TF. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. All right, yeah, so Coin Coinbase is getting sued, essentially. It, the, the, the purpose of this, or, or at least the way that the SEC is approaching it, is that they're selling securities, basically, or they're, you know, providing a platform to purchase trade securities. And the question is, is like what, you know, makes something like a quote unquote cryptocurrency, right? What makes that a security? And it's not really, I've, I've heard this, or seen this talk rather like on some forums. It's not really that you're expecting um, an increase in value from it. Like, you know, you could just say the currency is appreciating. But really what it is, is that 
um, quality of staking, right? So basically you like lock up um, your liquidity um, to lend out to people and you get more back, right? And that's essentially what they're saying kind of makes it a security. So we'll, we'll kind, of, <laughs> kind of see, I mean, this dropped uh, significantly yesterday, but, but what I wanted to bring up is Kathy Woods actually purchased a ton of it. And I feel like we should have, I don't know, some kind of new, new metric. Like if Kathy Woods is still buying stuff like this, um, that there's still a ton of money uh, basically in the economy, right? Um, they bought 419,000 shares of the cryptocurrency um, Tuesday, and this tumbled 21%. You know, if you still, if you believe that coin is going to come back, and Kathy obviously does, and she's always been like ahead of the game on stuff like this, um, or at least looking forward to different kind of, you know, like revolutionary ideas, at least. Uh, you know, in, in our culture, uh, this is not this would not be a bad buy. Obviously, it's a massive dip. I'm just concerned personally that, you know, like why would I not purchase this right now? And it's just I, I always feel it's it's kind of a bad idea to go against uh, the, the U.S. finance behemoth. Right. Like and again, I could be totally wrong and this could honestly skyrocket back if it if it beats the case. Right. But it'll be interesting to kind of see how they're going to argue that, well, what we're doing isn't couldn't really be classified uh, as a security. And it really is just um, a, a currency. Right. However, the way that it really does function, you know, especially with things like Bitcoin, like people are buying this. So it appreciates and they sell it off and then they keep uh, interacting or at least using uh, USD for their daily life. So we'll see how that goes. Very, um, you know, cowboy move. Um, by ARC. And so we'll see if that pays off. It'll be super interesting to see. Let's see as well, kind of more on it. El Salvador, if you guys aren't familiar, you know, the uh, new president, he had moved everything over, uh, not everything, but a large uh, amount of money over to Bitcoin and started um, basically accepting Bitcoin. And what they're going to do now, and this is wild, is they're going to use volcano energy. <laughs> they're going to use Energy from the volcano, renewable uh, power, uh, in order to mine Bitcoin. This is pretty nuts. The country of El Salvador is tapping into its abundant natural resource to create, quote unquote, volcano energy. Uh, according to a press release sent to Bitcoin magazine, the aim is to position the country as a global, excuse me, major global player in the Bitcoin mining industry while promoting energy competitiveness, diversification and geographic expansion for the Bitcoin network. Adopting a debt-free approach, El Salvador plans to construct 241 megawatt renewable power generation park in Metapan region. Very cool. You know, I mean, it's, it's cool from the sense of like, this is just a strange world, you know? Um, <laughs> and the, uh, the, the president of this country, he's a younger guy and uh, he, this is what you get in a sense. And, uh, you know, there's easy ways to kind of, I suppose, poke fun of it, but you know, this this idea, this desire to mine, mine Bitcoin, right? Of course, this is a new idea. This is a risky idea. Uh, it's totally not standard. So I can respect it from that uh, perspective as well. Um, but also the idea of just basically making essentially like a geothermal plant and getting power um, from a volcano, I think is amazing. And, and would that have been done um, if the end goal was not uh, to mine Bitcoin? I'm not sure. There's such an allure to doing that. And, you know, El Salvador, if, if Bitcoin you know, stays, you know, quote unquote strong and it, and it moves higher to where it was a few years back. Uh, that could be really positive for El Salvador. Super interesting regardless. Um, so yeah, we'll see how that pans out with Coinbase and CZ is obviously getting hit pretty heavily as well. Um, there's some little bit of talk going on regarding Shopify. Let's see if I can pull it up here. You have some analysts really liking it. They're they're reducing their kind of logistics portion. Um, I think they're letting go of some of their staff as well. And there's a big focus on essentially integrating AI. And of course, that's become almost like a, a buzzword, right? If the company uses AI, you got to get into it. Um, but, you know, Shopify is so, so massive and they have, they have great solutions, great plugins. And if you have a native AI built in for whatever, right, whether that's marketing or, you know, any kind of... Uh, you know, advice on how to how to price your products. I mean, this is this is pretty big, right? Even just getting decent data um, from some kind of native AI would be massive. And so it's definitely been flirting with this uh, last day with volume here. Yeah, like the lowest at uh, fifty three ninety eight. It kind of touched that at the beginning of April, uh, the fifty five level, and just really kind of resisted it up on uh, you know some some moderate volume. So take a look at it. 
I think, let's see if we take a look here. Uh, interesting. There we go. You've really had some pretty extreme movement on it, even with volume. And, uh, you know, even today, you had a nice jump down there. Anyways, take a look at it. This will be kind of in the future, I would suppose, with it. I would say in the next few months. Um, but a lot of analysts are looking at this as, as a buy. Um, I'm probably not going to get into it at all, but, you know, I've, I've used Shopify in the past. Shopify uh, really helps small business owners um, kind of just function. You know, it's massive. So, anyways, another big thing, and I was actually sent this by Z, so thank you very much for emailing me that, um, is some issues with corn. And there's basically a big drought going on. Here's the futures here, or the one minute. We just want to pop them in three months there. So this is the basically a huge drought in the Midwest, and this is the U.S. corn crop deteriorates uh, after Midwest hit by the worst drought in decades. Um, farmers in the Corn Belt uh, state uh, have been very concerned about their crops this spring as drought expands across the heartland. About 64% of the nation's corn crop uh, was rated good to excellent in the weekly report, and a five percentage point plunge that was most significant. Uh, it was the most significant decline uh, since eight, uh, excuse me August of 2020. Uh, and that drop was more than double of any analysts surveyed by Bloomberg. Let's see if I can get the picture for it. This is a nice one from the USDA, and this is the major drought area. Anyways, I pretty insane when you're growing everything right in here, yeah? So not exactly what we need when uh, food prices in some capacity were just starting to come down, at least regarding eggs, right? We kind of got over that avian flu scare, um, but it certainly... You know, on the outlook of, of, of inflation, this isn't uh, super great, um, especially if there really is like a massive, um, you know, increase, I would suppose, in prices. So let's see, too. Yeah, it's nuts. Seriously, look this, look this up on like Twitter or something like that. You can just see the, it is so dusty. 34% of corn production is in this area right here. So... Take a look, act accordingly. I know Basil is great at looking at the commodities, and then obviously our man Larry. If, if you're staying tuned for his show today, definitely ask him and see if he has any good entry points for him. Folks, stay tuned, we'll be right back. We're gonna talk about Shell a little bit, a little bit about China, and uh, a little bit about pharmaceuticals. might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. 
educating investors. Are China A shares hot or not? If you trade China A shares, now may be time to take a closer look. Trade CHAU or CHAD. Directions Daily CSI 300 China A share bull and bear ETFs. China A shares in either direction. Visit directioninvestments.com today. An investor should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the direction shares carefully before investing. The prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about direction shares. To obtain a prospectus or summary prospectus, please contact direction shares at 866 476 7523. The prospectus or summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back. So we, ha we have another Hindenburg report, this time uh, from Tingo, ticker T-I-O. Tingo is, uh, they essentially provide, quote, well, you know, supposedly, I suppose, provide um, like cell phone devices, like communication devices and other kind of tech uh, to Nigerian farmers. All right. This guy was focused. Uh, what is his name? Uh, Dozi Mbwasi. Mbwosi. He was featured on like GQ, touted as a billionaire, uh, doing all these. I I'm like such so like a one spit and twice shy kind of guy regarding uh, any companies um, in Africa. There was, um, it was called uh, Yumia, and they were supposed to be uh, the new Amazon of Africa, right? And this was when I was really young and I invested in it. It definitely got pumped and I was greedy and I was like, I could definitely uh, still make more money on this. Definitely could not. It, it collapsed, and I started doing more research. And the company really doesn't have anything together. This is Yumi I'm talking about, um, and you'll start thinking like there's not very good uh, infrastructure in a lot of places. Of course, your larger cities for sure are, are that's a positive, but um, I'm just always so hesitant now to look at any um, country co company coming out of Africa that that does these kind of things. So Tingo, uh, according to Hindenburg. Uh, completely fabricated everything. And they started looking a little bit more into their CEO, Doji. And uh, he has this company called uh, Tingo Airlines. Uh, it turns out he didn't own an airplane at all, and he photoshopped uh, the pictures, but he got a ton of money regarding that. Um, he already has been charged with fraud in Nigeria, um, made up the claim that he had a PhD. Um, he has a food division, right? Uh, seven months old and claims 577 million in revenue last quarter alone. Um, so, you know, I'm going to link this, <laughs> this uh, web page from Hindenburg. The bullet points, I mean, it just goes on and on about all these kind of false claims. So anyways, this, this just crashed today, and this is definitely going to get delisted. And uh, I don't know. I'm, not, I'm sure nobody is probably invested in this um, because I had not really heard about it until uh, last night, this morning. But quite a big move. And it's just always interesting seeing something come out of Hindenburg. I, I know there's some criticisms of Hindenburg and maybe some of their practices, but uh, super interesting article uh, anyway. So we were talking a little bit about, you know, some signs that uh, the economy is still not uh, pumping as well as it could be. Uh, however, let me see if I can pull this up for you guys. At least in the realm of essentially like textiles and clothes, um, it seems like there is still quite a bit of money to be spent. And I know we were talking about that um, a few times ago uh, re regarding some more like luxury brands, um, such as purses and all that. But this here is um, Inditex, which owns Zara. A second, I'll just click off this here. Had a strong start to the summer. Sales of spring, summer collection rose 16%. Net profit of 1.2 billion. And this isn't, this isn't even necessarily uh, brands that are kind of price prohibitive in a way. Obviously, Zara is like a little bit, you know, upper scale or whatever, but it's not like what we were talking about in the past where some of the wealthier people who are definitely padded um, from 
inflation um, or kind of economic hardships. Uh, they kept spending because they had the money, but this is interesting to see as well. Like even just more kind of middle of the road price wise, um, companies are doing fine. Uh, so it said Wednesday, sales of its spring summer collection gathered to a pace of uh, to jump 16% in May, uh, mitigates higher wage costs and keep customers on side during a cost of living crisis. The world's biggest fast fashion company reported a better than expected 54% rise in net profit of uh, 1.2 billion euros uh, for the first quarter that ended in April, um, exceeding an al uh, analyst's average expectations of 980 million euros. Uh, In-store and online sales rose 13% to 7.6 billion euros in the first quarter, uh, in line with the 13.5% seen in the first six weeks of the financial year. Uh, the results show Inditex, whose market capitaliz capitalization exceeded 100 billion euros for the first time last week, has managed to stay competitive while raising prices, mitigating cost pressures, uh, including a 20% rise in average wages. So that's pretty phenomenal. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure... I, I'm sure that a lot of this has to do also with kind of the leadership of this company, but it's just interesting to see when, you know, we should be seeing kind of spending slowing down. And, you know, this is the Europeans, but, um, you know, you would think they'd be hit even harder, right? So pretty interesting to see what happens. Also, in some more ways to kind of gather in stuff, we're looking at Starbucks here. Uh, this is just an interesting way to see how they're adapting uh, to, to new markets, essentially. And they're brewing up cheaper um, drinks, uh, essentially for Indians, uh, the Indian people. And this is uh, a way that they're trying to really maintain um, kind of uh, essentially profit in this, uh, in this kind of economy. So Starbucks is revamping its strategy to lure Indians, including children, with smaller, cheaper beverages as it looks to expand into small towns amid a fierce challenge from domestic startups and one of its fastest growing markets. Uh, among the first foreign coffee brands uh, to enter tea-loving India, the U.S. giant, and what, I mean, seriously, what an undertaking on Starbucks. I mean, that is you know, risky. They, uh, India is serious about this. Uh, the U.S. giant has taken almost 11 years to open 343 stores, in contrast with private equity-backed chains Third Wave and Blue Tokai, uh, that opened 150 in the last three years. So, you know, I mean, really, you want to invest in something like Starbucks, but they're just so widespread, right? Of course, you know, you can suffer a little bit um, if, if a country like India kind of takes the hit, um, but at least they're there. They have their head in the game. They have their feet in the water, and uh, that's pretty positive. Some more general news, um, and this is Shell pulling the plug, essentially, on the European retail energy arm. Um, Shell decided to exit its retail energy business in the UK, Germany, and the Netherlands. It'll be interesting, on a side note, it'll be interesting to see what, what happens. The, the PM of the, U, of the UK is trying to create essentially like an economic pact with the US currently. You know, it makes sense. I think the UK is uh, the biggest partner spender um, regarding military, right? Um, so it'll be cool to see if they can make a deal and kind of what that looks like, especially with the UK's exit. Um, from the European Union uh, a few years ago. Uh, so Shell decided to exit its retail energy business. Um, this is Octopus Energy, OVO, and British Gas have reportedly expressed interest in buying Shell's UK retail business. Um, Shell Energy, which currently has nearly 1.5 million customers, uh, was created with the acquisition of First Utility. So they're exiting the retail market uh, due to poor returns, essentially, right? Uh, the move comes out of Shell's strategic review of its European retail businesses which was initiated earlier this year in response to challenging market conditions. Uh, Shell said in a statement, that review has now concluded as a consequence that we intend to exit those businesses. Uh, a sales processes is already underway uh, with the intent to reach an agreement with a potential buyer in the coming months. Uh, while Shell has previously adapted to changes in the energy landscape, the exit from retail energy sector in these three countries highlights the considerable challenges in narrowing profit margins faced by businesses in a highly competitive and rapidly evolving market. But you know, this is a positive in some way, at least for their shareholders. Um, if, if you're just spending money and there's already people who are kind of like situated into that market, just get out and you'll be better for it at the end. Um, so, you know, in, in some ways this does create, you know, a void, but there's already so many other providers in these three countries that uh, I think it won't be long lasting. So folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back.
We have exciting news, Tigers. This June, Tim Ord of the Ord Oracle will be hosting two webinars, providing insight into his renowned market timing methodologies. On June 8th, Tim will delve into the S&P 500, teaching sentiment indicators, identifying market bottoms and divergence, and so much more. On June 15th, Tim pivots to the gold market, taking a look at cycle analysis, ratio studies, advanced decline indicators, and other important tools for analyzing this sector. Sign up today on TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Right. So some big news as well is Merck is selling, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Merck is suing the U.S. government um, over drug pricing reform. Basically, uh, the Congress passed a, a new legislation called IRA, um, which essentially allows Medicare, um, uh, Medicare and, and other kind of programs to, um, why can I not think of the word, <laughs> to negotiate pharmaceutical prices. Okay. Um, and you know, this goes away from the model. What, what these pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies would really do is dump a ton into R&D, and then they could kind of just charge whatever they wanted for it, right? There was a congressional hearing, I'd say a few weeks ago I was listening to, and uh, Congress was essentially asking uh, people uh, with insider knowledge kind of how this works, right? Uh, Merck in particular could kind of be, uh, pretty, uh, could be hit pretty heavily by this. Uh, they have a cancer drug called Keytruda. Um, a, a lot of these drugs are just so cost prohibitive, right? Um, as the government's kind of going on, they, I don't think, want to pay as much. And so these government regulators are going to be able to argue down um, quite a bit. Uh, basically, Merck is calling this um, extortion uh, and violates the Constitution in at least two obvious respects. Um, this is the first major drug company uh, to file a lawsuit, um, but they do think that others are going to come about. Um, but, you know, folks, something kind of needs to give a little bit with this. It, it will be interesting to see if I would suppose that... Uh, the the quality of manufacturing or research goes down. I'm not I'm not really sure, but what I what I do know is that um, these drug prices can be so um, expensive. Um, and, and when you're in a situation where you know someone is really suffering from something, and the only thing that they might be able to take in order to uh, get better and, and survive um, could easily bankrupt them. 
you know. So this is an interesting move by the government. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that sticks around. Uh, before we end, one thing I love bringing up some interesting research that comes out. This is from the University of Texas. Uh, it illustrates how caregiver speech shapes the infant brain. Essentially, folks, talk to, uh, talk to the toddlers. Talk to the infants. Uh, they benefit very positively from it. Uh, increases white matter. Um, it's really good. Folks, thank you so much uh, for sticking with me. Um, I think Steve might be back tomorrow. I'm not sure. Um, but either way, uh, have a great rest of your day. Stay tuned. We have TD Ameritrade up next. And then we have Larry. Stay tuned, folks.